Assalamualaikum and uh, very good morning uh, to everyone. Thank you for being part of our program today. My name is Dr. Musha Mustafa and I will be presenting on the understanding uh, for vitrectomy and buccal surgery. This topic can be very big, depends on how deep we're going to discuss. But for the purpose of this short session today, I would like to just concentrate on at least on one objective. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I hope to be able to highlight the importance of the selection criteria for these two common surgery for retinal detachment. Now, this is an overview of the presentation. So, I will touch about the disease itself, the retinal detachment, as well as the posterior vitreous detachment. Then, we will go into the principle of treatment for vitrectomy and buckle. And eventually, we will look into the uh, on how to make the decision between vitrectomy or buckle. Now, for the benefit of our students, uh, let us just recap on the different types of retinal attachment. So, we have the retinogenous type, uh, which is associated with a retinal tear, and treatment uh, renders from either uh, vitrectomy or buccal, or you know, in, in very selective criteria, we can still do a pneumatic retinopexy. Um, for attractional cases, we have this pre-retinal fibrosis and commonly is, in Malaysia is caused by the advanced diabetic eye diseases and uh, again, uh, treatment-wise is mainly vitrectomy, so we don't really do buckle for distraction cases. So I will not be discussed uh, in detail about this uh, component of disease and finally is the exudative retinal detachment, which is a disease involved uh, the abnormal RPE uh, which could either be due to inflammatory or ischemic changes. So again, exudative retinal detachment do not warrant any surgery, no vitrectomy or buckle, but mainly to treat the underlying medical problem of the red RPE. Now, uh, as we will be discussing on the comparison between buckle and vitrectomy, so uh, I suggest we should just concentrate on the retinogenous retinal detachment, uh, which potentially require either vitrectomy or buckle or probably combined surgery. Uh, now let us look into the disease itself. Most important step in treating the retinogenous detachment is to find all tests and to treat all tests. Uh, let's see some of the common features of retinogenous detachment. If you see a tear, yep, then we are lucky. The diagnosis is quite straightforward. Um, another feature of retinogenous component is there is a corrugated wavy retina um, another sign is when you uh, you are able to see a tobacco dusting behind the lens. Seventy to eighty percent of patients do have tobacco dusting uh, if they have a tear related detachment, and uh, sometimes you will also see a demarcation line which denotes a chronic uh, detachment, uh, commonly located inferiorly. And another features that we might see is the some of the PPR changes, all this retinal fold. Now let's go into a, you know, a more systematic approach of uh, looking uh, or describing a retinogenous retinal detachment. So first of all, we need to find the tear and try to describe in detail the features of the tear. Uh, we try to locate the position of the tear, whether it's actually you know in supratemporal quadrant, inferior quadrant. Uh, not only that, we try to determine whether this is actually a posterior tear or an anterior tear. Uh, we need to see whether there's any whether there's any posterior vitreous detachment, and we also need to evaluate how bad is the proliferative vitreous retinopathy. So at least these four important steps that we need to uh, look into when we see a, a retinogenous detachment. Now, uh, bear in mind, seventy to eighty percent of our detachment cases is related to the natural liquefaction of the vitreous gel. And a small proportion, 10 to 20%, is mainly non PVD related. So, these are some of the features of PVD related tear. When we have horseshoe tear, most likely it is PVD related. As you can see here, there's a horseshoe tear, flapping edge, a rolled edge, yeah, corrugated retina, very highly detached retina. Now, this is another PVD related tear, it's a paravascular tear, uh, rolled edge, as well as the um, uh, surrounding detached retina. Uh, a giant retinal tear, a tear which extends beyond 90 degrees, is again a sign of uh, PVD related detachment. So you can see a very large tear uh, involving the macula. Uh, another horseshoe tear with a bridging vessel. 
and another one is sometimes you will see a horseshoe tear at the edge of a lattice we can see a nice lattice here and a horseshoe tear which usually occurs at the uh, posterior edge of the lattice and you can see a bridging vessel now sometimes a lattice can also cause a non-PVD related tear in these circumstances what you see is not a horseshoe tear but you will see a hole within the lattice itself so um, this is one of the features that you can look for in tests to denote whether this patient has a PVD or no PVD. Now, other PVD related signs are the uh, highly corrugated retina, uh, presence of tobacco dusting, uh, and sometimes you can see a collapsed posture highlight behind the lens. And another feature is the Y ring. Now, when we look at the location of the tag, uh, not only at which quadrant, but also we will look at the uh, relation of the tear in terms of whether it's anterior or posterior. So how do we determine that? Sometimes if we are lucky, we'll be able to see the uh, vortex ampulla and this actually will denote the equator in the front. So anything beyond, anything uh, posterior to it is the uh, considered as a posterior lesion and any and anything anterior to it is considered as a peripheral lesion. So if it is a posterior lesion, then the most likely patient has to go for vitrectomy. And if let's say it is a peripheral lesion, which is anterior to the equator, so most likely patient can go for either vitrectomy or uh, buccal surgery. So if we are uncertain, what do we do? We will start to do an indentation. So when we do indentation, we will look for the uh, location of tear and look whether we are able to uh, oppose the tear and um, the tear sits nicely on the indented area. So if it is reachable during the indentation, so most likely this is a case that we can do buccal surgery. Now, uh, not to forget the stage of PVR and its location. Um, posterior or severe PVR definitely warrants a vitrectomy, uh, such as a star fold, and a per peripheral PVR might require a combined vitrectomy or a buckle. Now, now we need to find the tear, which is the most uh, important step. This is the famous Linkoff rule. There are a few other modified rules, but let's keep it simple as for now. So we have the basic four rules suggested by Mr. Linkoff. Remember that common site of tear is superiorly located. So rule 1, 2 and 4 is pertaining to superior location of tear. And rule number 3 is slightly, uh, uh, the position is slightly inferior to the uh, horizontal midline. So 1, 2 and also 4 is mainly talking about the superior location of the tear, which is a common location of tears. And uh, rule number 3 is describing about the uh, inferior detachment. Now, let's look at rule number one. Uh, it just says that when you have a retinal detachment, which is either nasal or temporal, the tear is most likely located at one clock hour of the highest border. So in other words, first thing we should do when we see a corrugated retina is to find the highest border of the detachment and look for the tear in the highest position of the detachment areas. And in 98% of cases, yes, you will find the tear at the highest border. Now when uh, rule number two says if you have a bullous superior detachment hanging from above, obviously crossing the midline, so look for the tear at 12 o'clock position or within the one half block hour uh, superiorly. Rule number three says if you have an inferior detachment, uh, look at the higher border and you will find the tear on the higher border of the detachment area. Now, uh, specifically for a bullous retinal detachment, uh, what we do is, uh, usually you don't find a tear anywhere inferiorly, um, look for the tear in the superior quadrant. And usually the tear has to be connected to the area of the bullous detachment inferiorly. Now, let's search, let, let's give it a try. So, let's search where the tear is. Now, you, when you do find a copy of a patient, you can see the patient has a uh, superior bullous detachment, very much corrugated. Macular seems to be, well, probably uh, probably quite spared in this particular case, but obviously it has crossed the midline. So, where is the location of tear? It is most likely at a 12 o'clock position or within one and a half clock hours. 
Now let's look at another example. If let's say when we do fundoscopy and first thing that we note is patient has an inferior detachment. Now what we have to do is we have to locate which uh, border is a higher border. So the easiest way to do this is by looking at the border uh, adjacent to the optic disc. So obviously you can see the uh, temporal border is higher to the nasal border. So where could the tear be? It has to be within the temporal uh, uh, retina. So this is obvious rule number three. And uh, if let's say another example, uh, when we see uh, another case of retinal attachment, you can say corrugated retina temporarily located with a nice white string. So you know this is actually a PVD related uh, detachment. So what we see is we were trying to find a tear and where is the location of the tear? It is within the upper border of the detached area. Now that is very important uh, to look for the tear and make sure it obeys the Linkoff's rule. If it does not obey a Linkoff rule, look very hard. Uh, possibly patient has multiple tear. For example, if let's say you do fundoscopy, but instead of uh, you find a uh, superior tear uh, during fundoscopy in the clinic, you only uh, you are only able to see an inferior tear for this particular detachment. So you know, if if the tear is located inferior in, inferiorly in this kind of cases, um, it does not obey the Linkoff rule. So look very hard. Most likely there is another tear superiorly. So. Uh, Try very hard to sort of uh, correlate between your fundus finding as well as the Linkoff's rule. Now, let's look at the principle of treatment uh, for retinal detachment, which is the buckle and vitrectomy. Um, I try to simplify the principle of treatment for retinal detachment so into FAST, F A S T. Uh, first of all, we have to find a tear because we need to treat all tests. And then we need to oppose the tear and we need to seal the tear and finally we need to relieve the traction uh, either by doing vitrectomy or buckle surgery. Now look for both vitrectomy and buckle. This is a comparison between these two surgery. So both surgeries are able to attain the objective of treatment obviously but in a different sequence and to a different extent. So for vitrectomy for example, uh, we will find the tear preoperatively or intraoperatively. Then we shall remove the vitreous by inducing the posterior vitreous attachment. Then we will drain the fluid internally by doing the internal uh, drainage to oppose the tear. And finally to seal the tear with either laser or cryo. Now remember in, in the vitrectomy cases, uh, the, the way that we seal the tear is either we use a laser or cryotherapy. So both uh, treatment uh, do not attain immediate addition. So what we have to do is all vitrectomy cases requires an endotamponate. Yeah? Now when we do a buckle surgery, uh, of course we find a tear. As you can note, the sequence of uh, achieving the objective for the treatment is not the same as the vitrectomy. So first we find the tear, then we start to seal the tear with a cryo. Um, we can do a sealing of the tear using cryo even even if the retina is detached. So that is the beauty about using cryotherapy. Um, some people would use laser uh, but to attain a good addition we need to make sure the retina is flat or the area of the tear is flat to be able to laser. So most of the time, we'll be using cryo for uh, buckle surgery uh, to seal the tear. Next, what we do is we oppose the tear uh, using a buckle. Uh, draining of fluid is not a must. Usually, we try to drain the fluid uh, enough for the tear to sit on the buckle. Mm. And at the same time, uh, you know, sometimes when you have a shallow detachment, uh, we might not need to drain the uh, fluid completely. So the way of draining fluid for buckle surgery is via the external route, uh, not the internal drainage. So this is the difference between the vitrectomy and the buckle surgery. Now, to release the traction in buckle surgery, usually we do not completely remove the traction. But what we do is we try to reduce the amount of traction to allow the retinal tear to sit on the buckle. Now, uh, let's look into the vitrectomy itself. So apart from the three pots vitrectomy, we can now do four pots vitrectomy. Uh, mainly all these uh, advances has, uh, you know, making the surgery 
uh, much safer and more predictable. So these are the common reasons why uh, a lot of surgeons are doing less and less buckle nowadays compared to uh, before. So what we do have now is we have the chandelier which will reduce the light toxicity, uh, allow the surgeon to be become more independent, uh, allow the surgeon to use both hands and again um, we can do a self indentation and do a lot of things uh, without the help of the assistant, which is one of the advantage of uh, vitrectomy. We have the illuminated laser, uh, again, to help the surgeon to become independent, and we can also indent at the same time. And nowadays, we have more options of endotemponate gases, silicon oil, heavy oil, and also heavy liquid. So the success of uh, the success rate of vitrectomy uh, can render from 80 to 90% with a primary repair. Now let's look at the sample of a uh, vitrectomy case. So what we're doing now is, you can see there's a shallow detachment, almost total detachment. So what we're doing now is we will start with doing a vitrectomy. Um, I will fast forward this uh, video, sorry that that appears inferiorly. So you can see there's a tear, superiorly actually. Um, and because the surgeon is sitting on this side so whatever on the top is the inferior and whatever here is actually the superior so what I'm doing now is actually I'm inducing posterior vitreous detachment so we have to leave the traction again you can see that I'm moving around the tear so to make sure that we clear up all the traction around the tear in particular um, it is a big horseshoe tear and if you can see it is actually at the adjacent of a lattice now, this is a heavy liquid, so sometimes in a bullous detached retina, we use heavy liquid to avoid incarceration of the retina uh, during indentation and shaving of the peripheral vitreous. Now, uh, we use uh, trimsnolon to make sure all the area of uh, vitreous is being cleared up. And finally, uh, we will treat the tear, seal the tear using the cryo. And finally, we will try to drain all the fluid from uh, inside, from the internal and finally uh, treat the tear with either laser or cryo. So if the tear is located peripherally, sometimes we use, we use cryo, but then if the tear is located posteriorly, then we will use uh, laser treatment. Now, um, let's look into buckle surgery. Uh, what are the advances of uh, buckle surgery nowadays? No, Previously, we always used the BIO, uh, the indirect ophthalmoscope, to do buckle. Um, usually, what happens is the buckle surgery will take like one or two hours, and uh, the surgeon will have a strained neck at the end of the surgery. And most of the time, the assistant will not be able to see anything. So, but nowadays, we can use chandelier with the help of the microscope. So, it is a much more beauty surgery nowadays. Uh, we do not have any issues with the strain neck anymore. Uh, old surgeons who are pressed by a pick can now still do the surgery. And the beauty of it again is the assistant will be able to see what the surgeon is doing. Um, again, uh, the, another advance in the uh, buckle surgery is uh, we used to do sutured uh, buckle. Uh, and But then nowadays people are actually talking about the sutureless buckle surgery. So those are the advances. Thing that is happening for the buckle treatment. Now let's look at how we perform a buckle surgery. So this is a case of a young boy um, and uh, you can see a very thick tenon and also conjunctiva. So what we're doing now is we are actually dissecting the, peri uh, the conjunctiva. So peritoneum is done, then we start to isolate the muscles. So this is done under the microscope. Uh, so we can s uh, see very clearly uh, what we are doing and isolate all the muscles, clear up all the tenons, a very thick tenon. Uh, we need to make sure uh, everything is clear out of the way and now we are using the chandelier to visualize uh, the fundus and uh, we suspect that there has to be somewhere superiorly. Again, uh, the surgeon is sitting here and uh, Whatever you see here is superior and whatever you see here is inferior. So once we find the tear, what we do is we seal the tear. In this particular case, uh, we use cryotherapy so that it doesn't come into the uh, recording. It's very much far periphery. Okay. Um, once we are happy with 
treating all the tests 360 degree um, what we're going to do next is to uh, oppose the tear so um, as you can see we will mark the position of the uh, suturing so placing the suture in all quadrant safely partial thickness in this particular case we did the encircling buckle using a 276 tire um, the reason being is because he's very young and he has some form of uh, peripheral PVR and the location of that is also periphery so that was one of the reasons among the reasons why we choose buckle for him so we then we tie the buckle in, again in all quadrant uh, during this process we need to make sure that the intraoperative pressure is not extremely high now what we're doing now is trying to drain the fluid from external so I use a prank technique uh, drain at the highest uh, detached area and you can see uh, the fluid came out from the now uh, the fluid came out externally so you can see the fluid is draining so concurrently we are pressing at the side of the puncture side so keep the fluid drain and we always try to make sure that the drainage side is uh, within the area of the buckle so it will be sitting underneath the buckle to prevent uh, retinal incarceration uh, then followed by the closing the uh, conjunctiva so this is how we do buckle under the microscope and with the help of the chandelier um, let's look at another way of doing buckle so this one I took from the YouTube channel um, because I me myself I rarely do a combined buckle and vitrectomy uh, one of the reasons is because the advances in the options of the endotamponite because we have the heavy oil that sinks, we have the second oil that floats so uh, me myself I already do a combined surgery so this type of uh, sutures buckle is usually done uh, concurrently with vitrectomy uh, basically to counter the anterior PVR so let's look at the video and how they perform the sutures buckle so we, they will create a partial thickness uh, scleral wound and uh, in all quadrant in all the four quadrant and using the 40 band buck, uh, 40 band uh, buckle going through all the muscles all around and finally encircle it 360 degree and tighten it with the Watsky sleeve and that is how they perform a sutureless buckle so they don't use a suture to uh, secure the buckle onto the sclera so now this is just a video to show the comparison between uh, how we oppose the retinal tear the differences between the internal and external drainage of fluid so we do internal drainage if we do vitrectomy now this is a case of i think it's a combined trt rrt but uh, i'm just showing this to show you know this is how we drain the subretinal fluid during surgery during vitrectomy so we are sucking the subretinal fluid using the cutter internally but if let's say we need to do external drainage for the buckle surgery this is how we do it again uh, the same technique that i have shown earlier on the prank technique is one of the technique there are various uh, technique to to drain the submetal fluid but this is one of it you can only safely do this if the retina is highly detached and usually that is why when the retina is shallowly detached uh, it is not a safe uh, technique to use so again uh, for a shadow detachment we don't really need to drain the fluid because what we want to try to achieve in a buckle surgery is just to oppose the tear peripherally uh, the rest of the fluid can be uh, absorbed by the uh, RPE now let's look at the differences in vitrectomy and buckle the summary uh, mainly looking at the duration of vitrectomy and buckle uh, 
uh, for a simple detachment surgery, vitrectomy can be very fast. Um, and that is one of the reasons why people like to vitrectomy more than buckle nowadays. Um, and buckle depends on the, the extent of the buckle and what type of buckle we use. It can be as fast as half an hour, but it might go up to two hours. Um, in vitrectomy, we can directly peel off the traction or remove the traction completely but for the buckle it is more or less an indirect relief of the traction and usually it is incomplete uh, we do not remove the traction but we just we will just uh, reduce the amount of traction um, location of tear if it is superior we can still use gas or oil and if it's inferior we can use a heavy oil as our endotamponate for the buckle any location you know um, is fairly doable with a buckle so location of the tear is not so much important in terms of superior or inferior, but what matters is whether it's a, a, a posteriorly located or peripherally located. Now, um, for draining of the subretinal fluid, we do it from internally, but for buckle, we do it externally. Uh, Post-op positioning for vitrectomy is mostly required, uh, but for buckle, we do not usually need a um, positioning unless there is a fish molding that if you will need to put in a gas and then patient might need to posture but you know rarely we have to use gas in the in in buckle cases now surgical cost wise it is much higher in, in vitrectomy but it's way cheaper in buckle surgery and when it comes to fovea attachment usually with internal drainage you can drain almost completely therefore the reattachment of the fovea can uh, be attained very fast whereas in a buckle usually the amount of fluid uh, being released is not as complete as vitrectomy so there will be some delay in the fovea attachment again when it comes to complication the long list between vitrectomy and buckle um, which can happen intraoperatively or intraoperatively or postoperatively. So for the intraoperative uh, complication, you can you know have all the complications related to the uh, intraocular pressure, uh, which might cause the the hemorrhage, uh, the phototoxicity issue of the light, uh, possibility of retinal incarceration, iatrogenic tear, and the GA related if we are using the GA for vitrectomy. But most of the time now we use a, a subtenon uh, LA. So uh, even sometimes we use more of GA in buckle cases compared to vitrectomy nowadays. Um, Postoperatively, we can still get endophthalmitis, all the related intraocular surgery complication, pressure related, which can either be low or high. Patient can have cataract, uh, especially in an old uh, group of patients. Uh, we can induce a lot more PVR with vitrectomy if you are not careful. Patient can still have recurrent detachment. Uh, and uh, finally, they can have a late onset glaucoma. For intraoperative complication for buckle, mainly is you know uh, due to the high pressure, which can cause epithelial edema. Uh, we can inadvertently uh, perforate the sclera through and through. Uh, we might cause a fish mounting of the retinal tear. Uh, and also, again, uh, we have to be very careful with the intraocular pressure because all the tightening of buckle might cause. Um, uh, increase intraocular pressure so we have to always check for the retinal artery pulsation postoperatively buckle can still cause endophthalmitis uh, but then uh, much more less compared to vitrectomy uh, sclera abscess uh, choroidal detachment or hemorrhage uh, retinal incarceration still can happen especially if we do not uh, realize there was a perforation during surgery uh, implant extrusion uh, diplopia uh, much uncommon but then can still happen. Uh, altered refractive error, recurrent attachment, and again, PVR. Now, this is one of the suggested flow of thoughts uh, when it comes to uh, how do we decide for uh, surgery for the patient. So, this is uh, from uh, British Journal of Ophthalmology. So, when you have retinal attachment, first thing first is look at the status of the vitreous. So, if it is attached, now you might want to consider scleral buckle, especially if the tear is located peripherally, especially when the patient is young. And if let's say the vitreous is attached, they suggest that you know uh, if breaks is treatable by indentation, yes, you might want to consider buckle, which means we have a peripheral tear. Uh, you might want to consider buckle, especially if let's say it's a MAC1RD, 
um, lens is perfectly nice and uh, you do not want to cause cataract by doing vitrectomy, yes, you might still consider a sclerobuckle in a vitreous uh, detached cases. Now, if let's say the bricks are not uh, treatable by indentation, that means you could not reach the bricks, um, you just have to go for vitrectomy. So mainly if the bricks are too many, it's too posterior, too large, uh, and if let's say the patient has vitreous hemorrhage, most likely you need to go in and do a vitrectomy because for, to do a sclerobuckle, you need a good uh, uh, clarity of the media. And again, if the artery is tubulous, you might need to do a vitrectomy rather than buckle.